Aloha, I'm Kaui Lucas on Hawaii is my mainland here on Think Tech Hawaii as I am every Friday at 3 p.m. Last week, I watched the mayoral debate on televised with the three leading candidates. And I was so depressed afterwards. I said, you know, I know there are other candidates. Um, and with a friend's prompting, I, uh, I looked them up and I did a little research and I came up with my own top three. And here they are. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that quite. Um, this is Ron Hoakley and Lawrence Friedman and Ernest Carvalho. Thank you so much for coming down to the Think Tech studio this week. And um, we're going to start out by, um, I just want you to have um, a few minutes to talk about, you know, why you're doing this. This is not an easy thing to do running for mayor. You were powered by something to, to get to this stage. So um, without further ado, why don't we start with you, Ron? Okay. I wrote down some ideas so I don't get uh, lose my train of thought. So I am Ron Hoakley, and I'm running for mayor. I've lived in Hawaii for over 50 years. I spent 25 years in finance and retired as senior vice president of Merrill Lynch. I'm also a former vice principal and teacher at St. Louis School and adjunct professor of philosophy at Chaminade University. Most of you have probably never heard of me because our current political system is designed to keep people like me out just like it's designed to keep people like you from having a voice in how our city is managed. Let me give you an example. People are sick and tired of sitting in traffic. I live in Eva Beach. We ask the city leaders to spend a reasonable amount of money to reduce traffic congestion. Instead, they spend eight to 10 billion on a rail system that was never intended to reduce the current level of traffic. As city, as city Managing Director Kurt Caldwell submitted the final environmental impact statement with the following words, traffic congestion will be worse in the future with rail than what it is today without rail. So why are they spending billions of our tax dollars on something that clearly won't fix the problem that bothers most of us? The honest answer is that it's being built to benefit special interests that in turn benefit the professional politicians. Rail funded Mufi Hanneman's campaign for governor, and now it's funding Kirk Caldwell's campaign for mayor. It's called pay to play, and it's been allowed to continue far too long. I can speak out like this only because I'm not a professional politician. I'm not a member of any political party, and I don't need a job. I'm here on behalf of all the local families who are tired of being taken for granted. My real hope is that together we can start a movement to take back Honolulu Holly for the people. When I got into the mayor race, I realized I had a very slim chance of uh, winning through to the, from the primary election. But I still thought that I would get a fair treatment by the press and I'll have my views uh, portrayed in the, to the public, and to give a real alternative to the, to the top uh, career politicians or the professional politicians. That wasn't the case, and, and so many of you have not heard of me. But I am running because I love Hawaii, and I know we can do better than we're doing right now. Thank you, Ron. Ron Hoakley. Okay, now next we have... Um, uh, Lawrence Friedman, please. Thank you very much. Aloha, my name is Lawrence Friedman and I am a candidate for mayor of the city and county of Honolulu. I am a recently retired corporate employee who is just like the people I am talking to in the camera. I am a citizen and a taxpayer and probably like a lot of you are fed up with the political system as it is. Much like these two gentlemen to my side here, we, I have entered the rate race because trying to get a different voice for the people. I, that's what my saying is, I am a voice for the people. To that end, let me talk a little bit about that. 
um, you know, we have our main issues of rail, we have our main issues of homelessness, and I just want to touch on those quickly, and then I'm going to move into some some areas because I do feel I distinguished myself, just differentiate myself from some of the other gentlemen here because I do feel that now that we've got ourselves started with rail, we just can't stop at Middle Street. We need to find a way to go all the way to Alamoana Center to make it to make it somewhat viable. We don't need. I think it's like eight more stations between Middle Street and Alamoana Center. That, that, that's overkill for a heavy rail system. So we need to find ways to mitigate that cost to bring it within a, a reasonable uh, cost structure. What frustrates me is when I hear from uh, politicians talking about how this, in hyperbole, how this is going to be done and how they're going to afford to do it. Private partner business, partnership, selling air rights. Well, why didn't Kirk Caldwell do that already? Okay, why aren't we at that? But instead, what we had is a tax increase to start rail, a tax increase in the middle of rail, and guess what? I'll say it now. You're going to have a tax increase to finish rail. I don't want to increase the taxes. If I become your mayor, I, I, I'm not running on a platform where, I will in, where I'm saying that I will increase the taxes. I'm saying I will try not to. But how can we not finish a project and just leave it half-baked? Half I'm also the only candidate of all the... Uh, people who are running who actually went in front of the heart board last week and read a statement calling for the heart board to ask for the resignation of the executive director and having failed they, to do that to then fire him on the spot because of his performance. He went in front of the, his leadership and said, hey, I need $900 million more for rail, knowing he needed an extra billion on top of that to finish the project. That's just one of many issues I have with, with the rail. But let me move on into the homeless situation because we, we see that as a continuing issue on the street. I, I don't hear of anybody talking about the children. Okay, we talk about homeless, we talk about putting them in housing, we've done this with that number. It only went up 1%. I mean, really, why doesn't the mayor talk about how he's reduced it 10% and we're on a trend heading in that direction? We're, we're slowing down the growth of it? Well, okay, but that's not fixing the problem. And the kids, the next generation, are very much suffering from this. Because as we, I will talk about later, I feel that education is a key to solving all of the problems we have here, or a lot of the problems that the people have the, uh, they call it the uh, 20, 55 by 25 initiative so that people of adult age get college educations and can move them out of menial labor jobs, move them more into the managerial positions within the hotel industry that we have here, a very vibrant hotel industry. So um, those are two you know, main concerns. I, as I take further into this, the unfunded liabilities, there's a lot of things that the career incumbent politicians Caldwell, DeJue, and uh, Carlisle don't talk about, which, by the way, as I call them, incumbent lawyer politicians. Is it any surprise we have problems when we have lawyers who are politicians, career politicians, running? What I feel is the two gentlemen here, I'm the best candidate amongst them, but I'm grateful that we are able to at least state our cases and have the people hear a different voice, voice from us. And so I thank you for the time right now, and I'll continue discussing some of my points as we move through this. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Ernest Carvalho, please, let's go. All right. My name is Ernest Carvalho, and I'm also a candidate for mayor of the city and county of Honolulu. I'll have to disagree with Lawrence because I feel that I am the best candidate amongst us three here. But that being said, I've actually got to form a relationship with them three. And these are these right here should be actually the top three, not the other three that you see. But I would like to discuss real just a little bit touch on real. Everybody's been talking about real that everybody's getting sick and tired of talking about real. Um, we really are. Um, do we stop at Middle Street or do we go? I do agree that it needs to come to a complete stop at Middle Street for a time out. Eventually, it has to be completed because if it does, it's not completed, then it becomes incomplete and becomes a rail to nowhere. And who's going to get on this rail from Makaha and drive to Everplains to get on the rail to stop at Middle Street, then get off to get on a bus again? It's just, it's not going to happen. It really is not going to happen. So eventually, we do have to find a way, and we have to find a way where we're not taking money from the taxpayers, yeah? Because the taxpayers have endured too much on this rail. Um, this rail serves nobody. It really doesn't. So many people are paying for this rail that they're not going to ever ride it. I mean, people on the Windward side, all the way down. Even in Ever Beach, they're not going to ride it. And right now, you've got reports that there's sinkholes happening. And sinkholes around the rail that's built in the ever, northern Ever Beach area. So, 
I mean, is this rail going to be safe? So there's a lot of things to look at when you get into office to see what is the safety of this rail? Is it going to even be safe for the people to ride it, right? So that's one of the main issues there. Another issue is homelessness, yeah? The government is not attacking homelessness the way it should be. It should be attacked on many different fronts. Um, you have, as Lawrence talked about, the children. Nobody's talking about the families. The families with children, they need to be immediately put into homes. Regardless, we have so many empty spaces in Kailai Loa that we can convert immediately into one or two bedrooms and get them in there. Because once they're in there, f people that are in homes feel better about themselves, so that's going to make them more productive. But somehow we're keeping our people down. Okay, so there's just so many groups that are out there they are talking about. So that's one group. Then you have the Native Hawaiians. Why are there so many Native Hawaiians on the streets? That shouldn't be the case. Native Hawaiians should have homesteads. We should be building more land, be building more homes or more lands so that we can get them into their homes. We need to find a way to correct this problem and address the Native Hawaiian issues and get them in there. They should be able to have their homes. Then you have the addicts and the drunks. Well, we need to get our drunks off the street. And I actually like the idea that San Francisco and um, Seattle uses. It's called wet housing. Instead of sober housing, it's wet housing. When you get them into it, the housing, and they, we know that they know they're going to drink and they're going to be allowed to have the drinks. But the statistics found that actually in wet housing, people say if someone starts off with 24 drinks a day, they've actually come down to about 10 drinks a day within a year because they have councils and everyone in there. And that wet housing actually isn't a party house. It's more like a covered lesson home. But this way we get people off of the streets, which reduces... Uh, our taxes because then we don't have to worry about the police tagging them or worry about them going into the hospital. So the services, you save about $5,000 per person by bringing them indoors and off the streets and cleaning your streets at the same, same time. Then we have several more groups that I would like to talk to, but before I get on that subject, there's a major subject that I is dear to me, and that is Red Hill. Why is no one talking about Red Hill, people? That's the subject that we need to be talking about. You have 20 tanks. Each of these tanks can hold a lower tower into them. That's 20, 10 by 10 side. Every single tank has leaked. Every tank has leaked. And tank, tank 5 leaked actually was 27,000 gallons of fuel. This is a contamination that's getting ready to burst, and it's going to cause a big casualty here in Honolulu. 600,000 people drink out of the aquifer that is only 100 feet below these tanks. So if they're telling you that there's no contamination, they're lying to you because these tanks will leak. So we need to really address Red Hill as much as possible. Thank you. You are so welcome, Ernest. <laughs> and as you know, I have had a, the Board of Water Supply on two of my shows to talk about Red Hill. So ye, amen to that one. Okay, we're going to take a little break and then come right back and talk to the other three mayor candidates. Hi, my name is Aaron Wills. You are watching thinktechhawaii.com. I am the host of the show Rehabilitation Coming Soon. You can catch us live on thinktechhawaii.com at 11 a.m. on Tuesdays. I will see you there. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and I'm fortunate to be able to host Sustainable Hawaii at thinktechhawaii.com. I hope you'll join in with us every Tuesday from 12 noon to 1 p.m. to see the interesting people we have to share with you their information. Aloha. Hello, I'm Patrick Bratton. I'm the host of Global Connections. I'm also a professor at Hawaii Pacific University. And my show and some of the other things that we do is show soft the collaboration that we have between Think Tech Hawaii and Hawaii Pacific University. So I look forward to seeing you and talking with you about a lot of issues dealing with Hawaii, the United States, and the world. Thank you very much. Aloha, this is Maria Mera, and I'm here to invite you to my bilingual show, Viva Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii, every other Monday at 3 p.m. We're here to inform, motivate, and entertain you. Join us. Hola, soy Maria Mera, y estoy aquí para invitaros a mi show bilingüe, Viva Hawaii en Think Tech Hawaii, cada dos lunes a las 3 de la tarde. Estamos aquí para informaros, motivaros y entreteneros. Apuntaros. Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kaui Lucas, and with me today are my favorite three candidates for Honolulu's <laughs> mayor. Thank you. And um, 
Uh, they got to talk about what they wanted, and now um, I'm, I've asked them to answer a question that um, keeps coming up in different forms on this show because I think it's really central to what's creating the pressure in, in our city. So, um, Larry Friedman, Lawrence, you are um, going to take it first. The question is, uh, according to the National Association of Realtors in their 2015 report, the real estate industry accounted for 25.5% of the gross state product in 2012. So uh, that number may change, but it's just indicative of the real estate industry is huge in our economy after um, defense and tourism. So how can Mr. and Mrs. Lee afford to keep their home? And where are their children going to live when foreign investors and non-resident buyers, who last year made up 25% of the sales here, 25% of the sales to non-residents. Well, thank you for that. And I, I do feel- There's an A oh, and there's a B. So okay. that's the A and then there's a B. They're, re they're tied together. So I'm just gonna read them both and then you respond how you like. So how can we deal with resortification that is residential real estate already in short, short supply, being used as vacation rentals, drying up inventory, and increasing rents? Well, a couple of things I've looked at when, when you submitted those questions to me is uh, exactly what we should be doing. And I feel if you look at what they've done in New Jersey, they would had what they call the Mount Laurel decision, which basically viewed that if you build only expensive housing, it's discriminatory in nature based upon the New Jersey state constitution. Now, quite honestly, I don't know if that is how it'll play out in Hawaii, but I don't see that happening here. Okay, so I feel that when you're building and, and you have an administration that's just building million dollar luxury condominiums, which is beyond the average pay of anybody, whether it's here, LA, Chicago, or New York, you know, they're, they're, they're excluding people in a financially discriminating way. And I really feel we need, to, we need to stop that and look at the Mount Laurel decision, which requires a zoning practice that makes you have affordable housing for people who can't afford it. Now, um, who are at the lower end economically, I don't want to say that people who can't afford housing should be entitled to it, but it's for people on the lower end of the economic spe spectrum, so that helps keep the pricing down low. We need to have our developers look to build housing that is not only million dollars and up. We don't need a concierge, you don't need a gym in every building, you don't need a pool, you don't need sub-zero appliances. We need to have that tailored down a bit for the people who live here. It's discriminatory in nature, I, I think, I'm not exactly sure, I'd have to look at some legal opinions, to just say that the people who live here should buy that, but there sh uh, excuse me, should be the only ones to, who buy that. But there should be some way to look at that, that so the people who are here have a first in. Having it the way it is now where you can buy a house, quote, a, a condo, affordable housing, in a year you can sell it at a profit, and there goes your affordable housing, one unit gone right there, and that happens time after time once the values of these properties get to be the cost in the, in the, uh, the rest of the building, such as the million dollar uh, housing. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll add on to that, but I'd like okay. to give the gentleman here a little time right. to talk Right. Did you have her. anything um, to add about the resortification, uh, resor the B&Bs? Yep. Thank you for that. And I do feel that what we also need to do is put out a blanket zoning uh, policy that you, you can't rent your house. Okay. Let me be clear on that, that what you have out there is rental stock now, and we shouldn't, we, that should be grandfathered. There's enough rental stock out there, there's enough weekly rentals, there's enough monthly rentals, and I think that we need to now look at some type of way to make it purely a yearly rental, okay, that if a condo goes up and the city has some type of zoning control over it, the minimum rental is a year in that. And then after that, it could be, you know, a month to month or a three month lease for the people who are in that. And then after that person moves out, it then becomes a year lease. That would prevent people from coming in and renting for a short season, three months or even six months. You know, a year lease is going to deter a lot of people and would give people the ability to um, rent that housing at an affordable rate. Thank you, Lawrence. All right, um, uh, Ron, are you ready to go? How can Mr. and Mrs. Lee afford to keep their home and where are their children going to live when foreign investors and non-resident buyers, 25% of the sales in 2015, are soaking up residential inventory? And how do we deal with resortification? Well, I'll take resortification first. Uh, that's a, a mixed bag because some of the people who are renting out to the B&Bs are doing it to just to afford to live in their house and I know some of those people myself. Uh, so to make a blanket uh, 
rule would be very difficult. I know it has to be regulated. There has to be taxes paid for these uh, these B and Bs, or but uh, I, I really don't know enough to say that you know have a particular view that there's a blanket statement on anything to that degree. But I would regulate it and know what's going on, and have that and have that information available uh, to the city planners just to to be aware of it. The in Hawaii, we have catered quite a bit to uh, foreign investors and very wealthy individuals who want to buy in Hawaii, and we're building for them. It's caused an inflation in the prices of materials and housing, um, costs for the people who live and work here. We can simply pivot and put an emphasis on the people who live and work in Hawaii providing permits and agreements, partnerships with uh, private firms, private developers, to build housing, both rental housing as well as permanent housing at an affordable price. I, I worked out a, a system just from my finance background that, and I consider an affordable house right now in Hawaii about $300,000. That's what I talk about. If a person is earning $15 an hour, uh, two couples, uh, oh, excuse me, a couple earning $15 an hour comes out to about $64,000 a year. Federal guidelines state that you should spend about 30% of your money on, on housing. So that comes out to about $18,500 or $18,500 a year or about $1,500 a month. If on a $300,000 mortgage, you can, that's a $1,421 uh, a month. And then now you have a possibility of home ownership and not just uh, rental. But there's a number of, of gentlemen who are doing very uh, significant things here. Uh, Dwayne Kirisu. 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 He's building out a, a plantation village. Uh, which will be primarily uh, aimed at the homeless right now. Uh, there's Stanford Carr, who's selling federal and state uh, uh, credits and financing uh, affordable housing. And there's Peter, Peter Savio, who's doing, uh, uh, what is he called, equity build rentals, where people can actually rent and get an equity in their, in their home. So we have some of the answers for these issues that you raise. Uh, but we have to, the city and county has to pivot and put an emphasis on, on that part of our, the ordinary person. Thank you, Ron. Those were some really interesting ideas. Okay, Mr. Carvalho. All right, so um, I've listened to your ideas. It's the first time I'm hearing these questions today. I'm sorry. Anyway, I didn't get a chance to look at it, but it's okay. Um, everybody's talking about affordable housing and building affordable housing. So, really, technically, there's only been 14 affordable homes or condos built since 2014 because, as Larry says, people move into them, boom, six months later, they sell it, it's no longer affordable housing. But I think the question is not about building affordable housing. I think the question is about how do we make it affordable for everyday people like you and me to live here in Hawaii? That is the question that we should be asking ourselves, and some of the ways we need to do, deal with this is to, one, completely get rid of the Jones Act, which is really crippling us. This Jones Act is causing us to pay way more than we're supposed to. So a container that goes on mats and that goes from here to Thailand, that goes from Los Angeles to Thailand, and one, the same container that goes from Los Angeles to Hawaii, this is the difference. The one that goes to Thailand is costing about $870, whereas the one that goes to Hawaii is costing you $8,000. Same products in that. So Jones Act needs to go because it is destroying us. Another thing we need to do is we need to look at each island, and each island must look at this differently on their own way. But in Honolulu, we must now start to take care of ourselves. We must be self-sustainable. There is no reason for Honolulu to be bringing in 90% of our food. That is ridiculous. This we must do on our own. We gotta stop keeping our agricultural lands agriculture and stop building. So I think what needs to happen is we need to put a moratorium for the time being, 
just for maybe about a year, get everybody on the tables from the real estate to the military all involved in this. Because the military also plays a big part of not being able to afford in Hawaii. They're allowing their military people, and just so you know, I did serve in the Air Force, okay? So, but they're allowing their people to go out and buy, no, not buy, rent homes and everything else. So when they go out to rent, they're only renting maybe, it's only costing them about extra $300, but the military is paying for everything else. So this landlord over here says, well, they're now paying $3,000 for rent. You're only paying $1,500. we are going to raise it up to $3,000. How is that fair? So the question is, how do we make living in Hawaii affordable for everyone? And if we can come around and figure that out, we can be able to do this. But we have to do this together as a team. And like I said, I am the people. You are the people. We are the people. And together as a people, we can make positive changes. That is good for Honolulu. We need to get rid of those that are running now because they're not going to do nothing. It's the same old boys club. And if you vote for Deju or Carlisle because you don't like Caldwell, then you're not doing yourself justice, and nor are you doing the people of Honolulu justice. Do the right thing and start thinking. You've got three great candidates here. Start thinking about that. That's it. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Caravaglio. Uh, in our last minute here, I just want to say thank you all. There is another chance today for hardcore fans of <laughs> my top three um, to go out and listen to them join um, seven other candidates um, out on Sand Island at the um, Hope Chapel there. I forget the number, but if you look it up, Hope Chapel, Sand Island, there is going to be a forum which eventually will be broadcast on OC16, but we're not sure when. So that's tonight at 6 o'clock. And um, parting words, how's it been running for mayor? Uh, I've, I've enjoyed this very much. I want to be a voice for the people. Um, to Ernest's point, please look at the three of us. I am, of course, the best candidate. But <laughs> if you vote for the same people who've got us in this mess in the first place, uh, Carlisle and Caldwell both said it was going to cost $5 billion. We're at eight, okay, and counting. They've made a $3 billion mistake in the private world, the corporate world, and I'm sure you would say that you'd be fired if you made a $3 oh, yeah. billion dollar yeah, misjudgment. Yeah. Remember, okay, you, vote for Caravallo because you know what? <laughs> I believe that I'm the better choice. I have a passion that if you, if you sit down with me and talk with me, you're going to see something that you've never seen before. Yeah? And Ron, how about you? Uh, I'm really upset with the way things are going and if you want to make a change in the future of uh, the city and county of Honolulu I think you should you should vote for me okay we'll see you next week back here at Think Tech Hawaii 3 p.m. Aloha Aloha, Aloha.